Hi, Terry. Uh, Mark Rhinelander here. Is anybody talking at the moment, or is this uh, we still on mute? No, no one's. We, we, we've still got four minutes to go. Right. Okay. But it, it's good that you're in the right place, and and it's also good I'm in the right place as well. But there's okay. about half a dozen or so people already on. Right. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right. I'm going to grab a cup of tea then. In that case. Can everyone see that presentation coming through? Yep, I've got a good on my end. Sorry, I was just getting all my audio sorted, Brett. Yeah, you're right. Just making sure. Yep. Um, so we'll give it kind of a few a few minutes there, and then we'll kick off uh, just after uh, just after the hour. Okay, I think it looks like most people are here. So, um, Brett, if you're okay, I think we jump into it. Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, so I'll kick us off then. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, welcome to the hydrogen hypothesis uh, webinar uh, Q and A session. Uh, so today, in terms of how this is going to run, um, we'll just obviously have a kind of a quick intro. Uh, then I'll hand over to uh, Brett and Terry, who I have with with me. 
uh, to uh, talk some more about TAD and the challenge. Uh, and then after that, we'll obviously open for a kind of an open Q&A. In terms of uh, asking questions for that, feel free to either pop them in the chat window there and I can read them out. Or alternatively, um, if you'd like to kind of um, ask the question yourself um, through chat, um, sorry, through, um, through Mike, um, just obviously use the raise hand function and we'll get to you there. Um, so I'll pop that in chat for everyone as well as we get through it so that they're there in case someone jumps in later, as well as kind of the general agenda. Um, but with that said, uh, we'll kick off. So obviously my name is Matt Burns. Some of you have been hearing from me throughout the challenge. I'm the crowd specialist on Earth, looking for looking after everything on this challenge from the Unearth side. And as I said before, I've, probably, I've also got Brett Triffitt and Terry uh, Fergus from the Oz Minerals team with me today. Uh, Terry, uh, sorry, Brett, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Brett uh, Triffitt. I work in Oz Minerals uh, transformation function and uh, really excited to have this opportunity uh, today to introduce you to our hydrogen hypothesis challenge. Um, so my job today is to give you a, a bit of an overview of who Oz Minerals is uh, and to also introduce you to our um, Think and Act Differently incubator that um, is a relatively new initiative that Oz Minerals um, is rolling out. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to, to TAD as we affectionately call it. Um, I'm then going to hand over to Terry Burgess. Um, we're actually really lucky to have Terry on board as our guest facilitator for this challenge. Terry um, is a very experienced uh, person who has worked in the mining industry for about 40 years um, and uh, he's had roles both in operations uh, and executive management and uh, um, um, business development um, in the mining industry. And more recently, since 2015, Terry's been uh, focused on uh, trying to see if um, he can unlock some value in the, in the hydrogen economy. And in particular, he's been working uh, with the South Australian government, um, assisting them with developing their hydrogen strategy. So we're really lucky to have Terry on board helping us with, um, uh, with uh, helping us with this uh, particular challenge. Um, so, with that said, I'll um, uh, I'll kick off with a bit of an intro to, to who Oz Minerals is. Um, so Oz Minerals is a, a South Australian based um, uh, mining company. So we're listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. Uh, so you can buy shares in Oz Minerals if you're brave enough. Um, and we would be considered a mid-tier mining company, so um, you know, relatively large in size. Um, so we have a, a focus on copper, and we also produce uh, gold as a byproduct of uh, producing our, our copper concentrates. Most of our operations are in South Australia, as you can see from, from the map here. Uh, so we have two relatively large mining operations in uh, the Prominent Hill province and the Carapatina province in South Australia. Our head office is in Adelaide, um, nearby to Prominent Hill and Carapatina, and all of our workforce fly in and out of Adelaide to Prominent Hill and Carapatina. We also have uh, a, a growing province in Brazil uh, called the Carajas province, where uh, we've been operating for the last five or so years and um, in Brazil we have a small operating copper mine called Antas and then quite a nice uh, pipeline of projects that you can see listed there. We also have a very active exploration program um, both in Australia and Brazil and also in Sweden uh, where we are working with uh, experienced explorers uh, to try to find the next uh, projects um, that we would like to develop. Um, the other project I'd call out is the Musgrave project, which is um, in Western Australia. Uh, so this is probably the next project that we will look to develop. Um, that project is it's very, very remote. It's near the border between South Australia, the Northern Territory and Western Australia. Um, because of its location, it will be a fully off-grid project um, run primarily by renewables. So we have a design for West Musgrave now 
that's looking at between 70 and 80 percent renewables penetration with uh, diesel fired um, backup um, uh, uh, adding the last 20% um, of the of the power supply. The project's looking at probably needing about uh, 60 megawatts of, um, of off-grid um, power supply. So at the moment we have a design for wind, solar and battery plus the diesel backup. Um, so that's a, a bit about Oz Minerals. Um, so let me talk about um, our Think and Act Differently uh, incubator program. So Oz Minerals has uh, aspirations to uh, achieve um, uh, a number of targets over the coming years um, in relation to uh, reducing energy and emissions, uh, producing clean products, minimizing uh, our waste and water um, usage, um, and to develop scalable and adaptable mining projects, um, and then also to uh, uh, take advantage as much as we possibly can of data and technology. So you can see those accelerator programs uh, listed on this slide. Um, and we recognize and have recognized for a while that we don't believe that the answers to achieving those aspirations exist within, uh, within the mining industry. Um, and because we, we've for a long time had a, a habit of going back to the same uh, list of engineering companies or consultants who always provide us with the same list of answers. Um, and so Think and Act Differently has been uh, conceived as a, a process and an ecosystem uh, designed to try to shape that kind of traditional approach to achieving our aspirations in those five key areas. Um, and so the process that we uh, have designed is uh, built around uh, framing our, our challenges, uh, diverging, uh, which is effectively what we're doing with, with the crowd at the moment in the hydrogen space, uh, and trying to generate as many ideas as we possibly can from as wide a cross-section of the community uh, globally as we possibly can, preferably from outside of mining if we can, um, because we don't believe that we have all the answers within the mining industry. Um, and then converging on a set of, um, of uh, teams or, or ideas that we would like to take forward and taking those teams and individuals and ideas into our acceleration program. Now in acceleration, we look to provide funding for uh, solutions to test ideas, to test experiments, um, and to support the, uh, the teams uh, who have what we think are, are the most promising ideas. Um, so this is now our second incubator challenge. Um, and so we're, we're still on a bit of a learning curve. And um, so far the uptake on this challenge um, has, been, has, been, has been steady. So um, it's, all, it's looking very good at the moment. We've got, I think about uh, 80 participants uh, signed up for hydrogen hypothesis. Uh, we've started to see an uptick in the number of submissions. So we're up to eight submissions this morning. Um, and we're really excited about uh, the direction this is heading. So this challenge in particular is about uh, helping Oz Minerals to understand what the potential is for hydrogen to help us achieve our aspirations to decarbonize. Um, so Oz Minerals has stated uh, that it would like to decarbonize over um, uh, in the near future. And we're now mapping out plans to help us achieve that. We're unsure about how hydrogen fits into that equation. And so we're actually asking the crowd, asking everyone on this call, to help us to understand and map out how we might achieve uh, a level of decarbonisation through hydrogen. So with that said, uh, I'm going to hand over to Terry and Terry's going to take you on a bit of a journey through starting with mining. So um, we're aware through lots of feedback that we've had that many people that are ideators or working in the hydrogen space um, don't have a good understanding of what mining uh, is all about and where the potential opportunities could potentially be from a mining perspective. So Terry's gonna run you through uh, a bit of a 101 on mining and then consider some of the potential opportunities in the, in the mining space uh, from a hydrogen perspective. 
And once he's finished, um, I'll come back on and give you a bit more detail on the challenge itself. So I'm going to hand over to Terry now. Great. Well, thanks very much indeed, Brett, and welcome to everybody who's participating in this webinar. Uh, this is a photo montage showing the normal operations you could expect to see at many mine sites, from exploration to production of the final product. product. Each of these stages of operation requires some form of energy and therefore are all potential applications for the use of green energy in one way or another. With regard to mobile equipment, current practice is usually with diesel or diesel electric, although some large equipment could be driven directly by electrical power, which again could be derived from fossil fuels. Power generation for metallurgical plant operations, such as ore grinding, is usually dependent upon location. If there is an electrical grid power, then it will be uh, powered from the grid. But if it's in more remote locations, it's likely to be either diesel or natural gas power generators that drive the metallurgical equipment. I'll flick quickly to uh, the next slide. Um, and I'm sure that many of you who are putting in uh, a submission for the hydrogen hypothesis challenge would have a very good idea of the basics of hydrogen. So I'm not gonna go into detail here. But one question that we often get, and I thought I would touch upon, are the various colors of hydrogen, as this is a focus for any discussion on decarbonization. Today, globally, there's about 80 million tons of pure hydrogen produced, with another 50 million tons of hydrogen blended with other gases for ammonia, methanol, and steel production. Almost all of this hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels, either natural gas or coal, with only limited control, if any, on carbon emissions. And this is the gray hydrogen. Replacement of gray hydrogen by green hydrogen produced from renewable wind and solar resources and electro electrolysis of water offers significant potential in reducing carbon emissions. Production of blue hydrogen from natural gas with carbon capture and storage would also reduce carbon emissions. And this is seen by many as an intermediate step to green hydrogen. Replacement of diesel in transport, particularly in long haul or heavy equipment, and power generation by green hydrogen would also significantly reduce carbon emissions. So this is some of the opportunities that hydrogen has to offer. The next slide discusses why the current time is more conducive to developing a hydrogen economy compared with some of the previous attempts. Today, there's unprecedented political, business and public momentum towards moving to a zero or low carbon environment. This is also reflected in a global research increase uh, in both research and development at, uh, at universities and businesses with a backdrop of significant cost reductions in renewable energy. Despite this being strongly driven by jurisdictions in Europe, Southeast Asia, and more recently in the US, there are some significant challenges for hydrogen with respect to scalability, cost, and associated infrastructure requirements. And one of the challenges we have is it's easier to maintain the status quo and be overwhelmed by all these various things that need to be done to have a massive scale up. The next slide, however, shows that such scale up is possible and if implemented would dramatically reduce associated costs. And this slide here shows the trends that we've seen in other technological technological advances in energy. The development of the global LNG industry, the liquefied natural gas, from zero since its first international shipment in 1964 has been dramatic. Global trade in LNG driven by economic growth has quadrupled in the last 20 years and is forecast to double again in the next 20 years. And similar spectacular growth close to exponential has been seen in the area of solar power. And with the growth in usage, there has been a significant fall in costs. And it's been shown that the cost of solar energy has reduced by 20% for each time production has doubled. So these parameters could also be possible with respect to the cost of green hydrogen through electrolysis as the production scale increases. The next chart is taken from the Hydrogen Council 
and shows multiple uses of hydrogen in transportation, residential and commercial buildings and industry. The majority of these applications are also applicable to the mining sector, especially for large remote sites, which would have similar facilities in place as would a small town. The most, pub, uh, most familiar public association with hydrogen uses today is going to be likely to be transportation with small vehicles, buses and some trains in daily operation around the world. And an anecdotal gauge of public perception might be the question asked about what passengers on hydrogen buses in Cologne thought of the new hydrogen bus. And the response was that the passengers don't really care about how the buses work, but they're only interested on whether it's arriving on time. The next slide starts to talk about some of the uh, activities that hydrogen is seeing in the mining sector. And the photo on the bottom left is the Raglan mine located in the Nanavut region in northern Quebec. The area is only accessible by plane or during ice-free periods by ship. The mine site is therefore completely self-sufficient and operates like a small town and very similar to what Brett talked about with the West Musgrave project being so remote uh, in the center of Australia. So at the Raglan mine to reduce its dependence on diesel imports to the site, wind turbines, a flywheel, a lithium ion battery, electrolyzers and hydrogen storage have all been installed. And these renewable energy devices have reduced diesel usage by 3 million liters per year. Other initiatives underway in the mining sector shown on this slide uh, include Anglo-Americans trial open pit haul truck in one of its platinum mines in South Africa and initiatives by Fortescue on their iron ore projects in Western Australia. Slide, the next slide shows that hydrogen transportation, storage, and the preferred transportable form of hydrogen are all areas which will need to be addressed if there's gonna be a global hydrogen economy. There are many questions that are being asked about how to transport hydrogen, how it should be transported and in what form, and then once it's produced, how is it gonna be stored? And these questions are being addressed. And I think with the example of, that we've seen with global LNG trading indicates that with high levels of demand, these transportation and storage issues will be solved. There are already examples of countries preparing for the increase in scale. Europe, for example, has expanded its dedicated hydrogen pipe work network linking the major ports to industrial centers. Japan and Korea are looking at trials of hydrogen ships. The next slide looks a bit into the future and envisages the potential of hydrogen in all the stages of mining and metallurgical processes from green hydrogen production to renewable resources to the finished metal product. product. On the left-hand side, there is a list of various applications and uses of hydrogen. Green ammonia is mentioned with the possibility of production uh, from green uh, hydrogen using nitrogen from the air. Um, you could then imagine producing green explosives, and that's already been looked at by some of the major explosives companies in the world. Green copper, green zinc, green nickel, green steel are all being discussed, and it will be a combination of hydrogen use in the mining and metallurgical processes, both the hydro and the, importantly in the pyrometallurgical area, where you, you are taking concentrates, uh, and other forms of, uh, um, of, of the uh, unfinished product uh, into the finished product through smelting and refining. The next slide is, gives you the key information on the hydrogen hypothesis challenge, which Brett will take you through before we answer any questions that you might have on hydrogen in mining and the challenge itself. Thank you, Terry. So, Hydrogen hypothesis uh, is all about, as I said before, about um, helping to Oz Minerals to understand where the potential use cases are for hydrogen in, in mining. Uh, there's lots of talk about using hydrogen in mining, um, but so far we've not seen too many examples of, uh, of concrete 
um, examples of, of hydrogen being used in mining and, and Terry flagged a couple of the, the more prominent ones. Um, but still the uptake is, is, is relatively low and we're trying to understand um, if this is an area that we should, we should potentially focus in our, in our decarbonisation efforts. Um, so what we're asking is for the crowd to share your ideas around potential use cases for hydrogen in mining. Um, and what we would like to do as Oz Minerals is to actually fund your first experiment. So um, an experiment could be anything from, you know, a laboratory scale experiment to a, a pilot um, test on site. It could be a, a cost model. It could be a feasibility study or a pre-feasibility study. Um, so broaden your thinking around what an experiment actually is. Um, we will fund the first piece of work uh, in order to uh, de-risk and understand the use case for, uh, for hydrogen in mining. So, so this is an eight week challenge. So we're about four weeks now into the challenge. The final deadline for submissions is the 28th of May. Um, we have, as I said before, received uh, eight um, early submissions. Um, so we will endeavor to, over the next week or so, get in touch with those who have put in early submissions. So if you are online and you've provided an early submission, thank you very, very much. Uh, we're really excited to uh, see those starting to come in. Um, we'd like to um, uh, get in touch with you and provide some feedback on your early submission. Uh, so after the submission closes uh, on the 28th of May uh, through June, we will look to review and assess those uh, submissions and decide who we would like to take forward into our acceleration program. Um, and that acceleration program will kick off towards the end of June, uh, where we will uh, provide funding and support and, um, and a few other things that we're working on in our acceleration phase. Uh, to provide, uh, um, to, to make it an interesting experience for, for those who, uh, who, who are involved. Uh, so if you haven't registered already, I'd encourage you to get on to the Unearthed platform and register for Hydrogen Hypothesis. So the, the link is there and I think we're going to send this uh, presentation out. So you can click on the link if you haven't seen it already via other means. Um, when you register, I would really, really encourage you to join our Slack conversation. So uh, I think we have about 50 people involved in the Slack conversation at the moment. So when you sign up on the Unearthed platform, you'll see a link to join the Slack conversation. That's an opportunity to get involved in a conversation, share what you're working on, um, you know, talk about your great ideas and even look for opportunities to work with other ideators. The other thing I'd encourage you to do is jump onto the Think and Act Differently um, website, which is via our, our Oz Minerals website. And you can see the link there where you can register to get more information on the TAD program uh, and also uh, learn about some of the other challenges that we've been running um, and, uh, and register to get some more information about, the, about our challenges as we go forward. So with that said, I'm going to hand back to Matt, who's going to lead us through uh, a bit of Q&A. So we're going to open it up to, uh, to get your questions. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, yeah, and also, thank you very much, Terry. That was a really great run through uh, earlier. Um, in terms of questions, we've got a few there to kick us off. But as I said, if, um, if anyone does have questions, please just drop them into the chat. Um, we'll use the raise hand function, and we can get to you there. Um, but to kick us off, uh, so the first question I've got, I'll pop it in the chat as well so everyone can kind of uh, see it. Uh, give me two seconds. So I'll pop that one there. Um, and the question is, I see that you are focused on green hydrogen, but our idea is going to result in an effective blend of green hydrogen and fossil fuels. Is this of interest to you in this challenge? You're gonna, th you're gonna throw to me, Matt? <laughs> Yeah, I think I might I might throw to you. I'll I'll, I'll um I'll leave it to you, Brett, if you want to throw the one throw uh, any of them to Terry. Sure. Yeah, great question. I, I think the answer is yes. We want to hear all and every idea related to to hydrogen use. I think um, you know we recognise that we're not going to get there in one fell swoop in terms of getting to uh, one hundred percent decarbonised. So uh, this is clearly going to be a pathway uh, via numerous means and I think any 
uh, any application of hydrogen, whether it be gray or, or, or blue or green, uh, that allows us to offset um, diesel usage um, is something that we want to hear about and learn about. Right, and I think um, there was another uh, question I actually had that kind of tied into that. You know, you, you're talking about diesel there. Um, I'll pop it in the chat as well. Um, and that is, it's a bit of a longer one. Uh, the question is, we have some ideas on how green hydrogen could replace diesel. Uh, however, we are concerned that large companies will simply take our idea and develop it themselves. How can we test our, our ideas and ensure that we can retain the IP? Um, we are not sure how our ideas might work in the mining industry as we do not know much about mining. Can we work with you on this? Oh, the answer is absolutely. Um, so I, I think on IP, uh, we would go to great pains to stress that um, we're not interested in owning anyone's IP. Um, and so, you know, we would sign agreements that, uh, that emphasize that, um, you know, effectively all we're looking for is a, is a license to use your IP um, and whatever commercial arrangements are associated with that, we're, we're happy to, uh, to have those conversations. Um, so 100%, I'd really encourage you to put in a submission um, and really encourage you to, um, to get involved in the conversation and, you know, we're happy to, to have uh, a discussion about IP um, and to provide surety and comfort that, uh, that your IP is safe uh, with us. Uh, yeah, great. Um, so actually, I've got a, I've got a follow-up question. Um, this is kind of one I've put together, but I think it might be relevant to, to that there. Um, the, the, in the challenge, we talk a bit about um, partnering with teams and offering support, things like that. So obviously, we've covered some of the IP aspects there, but can you tell us a little bit more about what what that partnership, what that support could look like for different teams? Sure. So, uh, yeah, we recognise that ideators are going to come to us um, from different backgrounds. So, you know, whether you're a uh, uh, a lone wolf consultant who has a great idea uh, through to uh, small scale startups through to more established companies. Um, so we recognize that people are coming from different backgrounds and will need different types of support. Um, in essence, what we're looking to provide is a, um, uh, uh, a series of um, uh, information sessions as we go through um, the execution of, of the challenges. Um, we can provide uh, legal and commercial support. Um, we can provide. We can put you in touch with our ecosystem of um, of testing uh, facilities, testing partners um, in the mining space in particular. Um, we can put you in touch with our. We we are in, um, developing partnerships with uh, commercialization partners. So um, organisations that can help you get funded if you don't have um, access to funding or you need funding. Um, uh, and we are also conscious in particular in this space that uh, ideators are not coming from a mining background. Um, and so part of our program would be uh, opportunities to learn about mining. So we would run uh, webinars, um, information sessions, if you like, on, on mining. We've kind of scratched the surface today, but the intent would be to get into a lot more detail around in particular Oz Minerals and we can teach you all about how Oz Minerals works um, and, and support you to try to find the, the right application for your idea within our specific environment. Um, so that's a little bit about the offering. Um, and it's, it's, we're, we're still uh, evolving this offering and you know, we'd also welcome feedback from, from others around what, uh, what they would like um, in terms of uh, in terms of support. Great, thanks, Brett. Uh, so, Mark, uh, you've you had a question and you've also raised your hand. I uh, might throw to you to um, ask that one. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, so, my first one was uh, in terms of the peak load. Is that around sixty megawatts? Is that what you said earlier on? Uh, so Mark, hi, nice to meet you. Um, so West Musgrave is 60 megawatts um, yeah. 
our prominent hill and carapatina operations are kind of circa that so in that probably in the 40 to 60 megawatt sort of range so those are the kind of scales of operations that we have although although having said that in brazil our, our operations are much smaller so they'd be they'd be much smaller than that right uh, and and what are, in terms of like the energy megawatt hours how much has been covered by diesel uh, so at Prominent Hill and Carapatina, we're connected to the South Australian grid. Um, and so we're sourcing all of our power from, from the grid effectively. Um, although recognising, of course, that South Australia is running, I think, about 60% renewables now. Um, at West Musgrave, as I said in my intro, um, which is about 60 megawatts, that's um, kind of 70 to 80% renewables, 20 to 30% diesel um, diesel and or gas. So we're still, uh, I should be clear here, West Musgrave is a project that's in feasibility study. So um, it's not an operation yet. Um, and we're currently considering a trade-off between diesel and gas for, uh, or trucked gas for, uh, for the, for the non-renewables part of the, of the load. So have you eliminated the possibility of using hydrogen on West Musgrave? Uh, I don't believe so. I think we'd still be open to hearing new ideas around how to introduce hydrogen into the into the West Musgrave solution. Because because we did submit a um, proposal around that um, on that other project. Um, the the other question I had was um, yeah I mean basically with any of your projects one of the one of the ways that we've found um, to make hydrogen economic um, and we've got you know, some um, advanced modeling tools for doing this, is if you've got any potential off takers around the mine for the excess, uh, the excess energy that you're gonna be producing. And that, the main thing is, is that you don't get a good match when you're trying to minimize your capex on the hydrogen generation side and your hydrogen storage side, you, 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 because there isn't a good match between your generation and your load, you will always generate some excess, um, excess energy. And so one of the, if you can actually have off takers around you that will take that energy and, uh, you know, pay some amount for it, then, then that enables you to get a levelized cost of energy, which is actually, you know, below retail rates of, um, of energy at the moment and that that even in a remote area if you've got the off takers so mm -hmm. that off takers might be other you know close by mining projects or it could be you know it could be communities um you know really any, anybody is a power consumer mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense mark and i would i would imagine that in the case of carapatina and prominent hill where we're grid connected that the opportunity then exists to to feed that excess power back into the grid yeah, that would be another option that you would have there. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. And you would be able to do that potentially at uh, times, you know, when there's, uh, you know, when there's a high, uh, a higher value for the kilowatt hours. Yep, yep, hundred yeah. percent. If I could come in, could I ask a question about whether or not one of the off takers could, in fact, be the mine with the mining fleet? So you could have a number of vehicles that are um, available for. Um, any excess energy that's been converted into hydrogen uh, and then use it there. So that would reduce the amount of diesel you had to import at, at whatever cost that would be. Yeah, so I mean, it, it really, it, I guess it all comes down to, you know, what, how you frame what your demand is uh, in terms of, so, you know, if you've got um, electric vehicles being charged, well, that's, you know, that's adding to the load on the grid. Um, so, you know, if they were outside of the original sizing, then yeah, that, that would be a potential off taker. Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks for the questions, Mark. Um, I might move on to Colin's question we've got here in the chat. Uh, Colin asks, would Oz Minerals be interested in a study to explore how a mine design and schedule would have to change to enable the operation of a hydrogen powered mine and the evaluation of the options. Thanks for the question, Colin. Uh, I think the answer is yes, we'd like to explore what that could potentially look like um, 100%. So if you'd like to put in a submission, uh, we can set up a time to have a chat. Um, definitely interested in hearing about that. 
Great, thanks, Brad. I think that actually ties into another um, question we've kind of had floating around. Um, it's around like whether is Oz Minerals interested in just um, sort of physical like studies and experiments, or are they also interested in kind of um, I think uh, the reference was desktop experiments or desktop studies. Yeah, definitely, Matt. I think, uh, and I tried to emphasize that in in my comments about the the, the funding the first experiment. I think uh, stretch your imagination around uh, what a what an experiment could potentially be. Uh, don't just think of it as a traditional laboratory type experiment. Um, anything and everything. I think we're interested in hearing about whether it's a desk desktop study, a, you know, a cost trade off study. Uh, feasibility study um, or a pilot trial of some new technology um, or, a, or a laboratory experiment um, as well. Uh, we're interested in all of those proof of concept type work. The focus really has to be around de-risking. So if you have an idea, you must also have an idea around what the riskiest assumption is with that idea. And then you need to think about the work that's required to de-risk that kind of riskiest assumption associated with that. Yeah, that, that's that's great. I think it, I think it's good that the challenge is sort of open to, you know, as you said, any, anything and everything. Um, that actually brings me to another question we've had around kind of being open to anything and everything. Um, obviously, some of the teams that are submitting are not from Australia. Um, uh, I've got the question here. Um, yeah, so there, um, we, we've had some questions from international companies. Essentially, the question is, could you expand a little bit more on how teams outside of Australia can work with Oz Minerals and, and get involved and kind of what support um, you know might be able to be offered there that that kind of stuff. Sure. Uh, so we we work with international consultants, um, international laboratories, international research providers all the time. So we've got a lot of experience in working with uh, with international um, networks. Uh, so uh, you know the, the the mental model I have is that. Uh, you can host the experiment um, in whatever location you need to. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that happens on site at one of our operations. Um, it can be a proof of concept that you host in, uh, in whatever country you're operating in, um, whatever jurisdiction feels comfortable to you. Um, and we would have to just set up uh, the appropriate governance structure around, you know, making sure that we uh, uh, got access to the to the results and we we're involved in the conversation. And um, uh, so, you know, very open to, to working with international companies for sure. Yeah, that, that's really good to hear. And I think um, one, one of the other things we've got in the experiment proposal template uh, is that section around what support you might require from Oz Minerals. So um, one of the things I suggest is any international teams just kind of articulate some of those things there if you do have an idea of what, what support you might require or or be looking for um, make, make sure you're articulating it uh, in that section as well um, so I'll move on to the next question uh, we've gotten from Raymond uh, any comment on the focus of the challenge uh, sorry any comment on focus of challenge between fundamental work on generation and storage etc versus application of technology being developed by many others such as transport versus significant process changes to use hydrogen uh, very differently as they will require different work. Thanks, Ray, good question. Um, look, I think, I think we're really interested in the, the use cases rather than the, um, the production and the production kind of cases. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the transport side of thing is, is of particular interest to us when you think about uh, where all of our emissions are. Uh, they're primarily in diesel um, haulage um, and, and then offsetting the, um, the scope two. Um, so the, you know, the electricity usage that we have. Um, so uh, I think the, you know, the, the focus is really gonna be in that, in, in the, in that sort of area. Um, now, whether we're focused on TRL one or TRL nine, I guess is another question that I'm kind of reading into into what you're what you've said. Um, I think we're we're happy to receive proposals at any stage of TRL. Um, you know, recognizing that uh, things that are at TRL advanced TRLs at the moment are probably not 
uh, still need work to, to become feasible. Um, and so, you know, the more disruptive type approaches that are lower TRLs are, are I think, of particular interest as well. If I could add something, Brett, as well, I think that um, one of the things that I believe is very important is to, is to actually focus on applications um, because uh, everyone sees um, the end sort of prize with green hydrogen is very large scale export of hydrogen to other uh, countries uh, that uh, are trying to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, but unless there's these stepping stones, unless these is applications uh, which people can see locally that can uh, uh, add value and be scaled up um, over a period of time, I think it's going to be very difficult to sort of imagine huge step changes with regard to green hydrogen. And especially in the mining sector, I think that you're going to be more successful if you introduce some smaller ideas that can be implemented and are successful and coming up with really big ideas uh, that are going to appear to be really risky. So when people talk about, you know, we, we've got an idea to um, convert all the forklift trucks on a mine uh, to hydrogen, that's just as valid, I think, um, as somebody who says that we've already solved the problem with uh, an open pit haul truck, um, but it's going to take another five years to develop. So I think that that's why it's important to me, where you see hydrogen cars in the street, hydrogen buses, hydrogen trains, where people can become comfortable that the technology <coughs> is working and that hydrogen has a, a, a place, and then you can scale it up to the next stage. So I think it's really important, no matter what ideas people have got, no matter how large they are, they actually do sort of bring them to the fore because those will possibly be the ones that actually will become implemented more quickly. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, thanks, Terry. That, that's, um, that's really good to put. Uh, we've also had another follow-up question from Mark. Uh, Mark, you want to know how much is available for each experiment? The, the, uh, the most important question, hey, Mark? Um, <laughs> so we actually don't have uh, a set budget for this. So we're, we're really interested. We, we don't want to constrain the thinking either around um, uh, what you would put forward as, as your potential experiment. I think the, the, the larger the experiment, um, we would want to see a, a greater degree of impact uh, and a greater degree of de-risking from that particular experiment. But I, I think that the short answer is we don't, we don't have a, a set budget for this at this stage. Um, we want to encourage everybody to put forward uh, their experiments and um, uh, and we will make a decision based on the number and quality of um, experiments, uh, you know, who will take forward um, into the acceleration stage. Great, thanks for that, Brett. Uh, so I've also got another question uh, here. Uh, we have an idea on introducing green hydrogen in mobile equipment uh, in warehouses, mainly involve, involving pallet handling. Uh, is this in any way relevant to the mining industry as an impression is that you would only be interested in hydrogen for open pit trucks and diggers? I'll pop that one in the chat as well. Yep. Look, I think, uh, I think we'd love to hear more about that. I think, uh, uh, you know, as Terry was talking about the, uh, the con converting of, um, of forklifts, for example, um, is a it's a it's a the thin edge of the wedge, right? So it's uh, it starts the it starts the conversation. It gets people used to the idea of having this equipment around. Um, and what's to say that the pallet handling idea doesn't evolve over time to uh, include larger pieces of equipment as well? So you know, I think we'd really love to hear about that stuff. So I guess just for clarity, we, we actually do have warehouses on site in both in all of our operations. Um, you'll appreciate that we have a lot of uh, spare parts um, and consumables that are housed in warehouses, and we we have forklifts and and pallet handling equipment running around managing those uh, uh, that that gear. So absolutely, think it's it's worth hearing about. I think one thing 
maybe I could add, Brett, as well, is that it's difficult for a lot of people to imagine exactly what does happen on a, on a mine site. And I remember when we were trying to expand um, recruitment within the mining industry, um, we, we started to tell people that, you know, if you're, a, if you're a medical nurse, there's jobs in the mining industry because we run first aid clinics and small um, facilities for the workers. If you're in catering, then there's work in the, in, the, in the mining industry because we provide food uh, to all the people that work on remote sites. Uh, if you're in aviation, we're interested in people flying in uh, planes to uh, fly in, fly out. So I don't think that people should be limited um, by what might happen in the mining industry. And I think it's the imagination about the idea and, and whether or not you can actually perfect that idea is possibly more important than its application because the mining industry has an application because there's it's such a diverse industry. Uh, with so many aspects. So the forklift truck, the pallet handling machine, um, uh, heating for, for houses in, in places like Nanavuk, uh, where the Raglan mine is, all of those things can uh, be applications that can be used. So you, you shouldn't limit the imagination. If you've got an idea, I'm sure the mining industry will be able to use it. Thanks, Terry. Um, so just a, just a reminder as well, um, we've probably got another few minutes for questions. So if you do have any more, uh, pop them in the chat. But uh, if you come up with any after, um, or we you know, maybe we didn't get to them, um, we've also got the Slack and the forums uh, that we've mentioned. So obviously pop them in there or you can shoot us an email or something like that. We can make sure um, we're getting those answered. Um, but yep, a few, few more minutes uh, and then we'll probably look to be wrapping up. We do have another question from Aaron. Um, Aaron has said, Great program from Oz Minerals. Well done. Uh, are you able to provide any indications of your scope of your key scope one emissions that you would like uh, to target as early as possible across the company or site specific? Uh, is there a list, et cetera, available to guide submissions? Great question, Aaron. Yeah, terrific question, Aaron. And thanks for the feedback on the program as well. Um, so look, the, the key scope one emissions would be all, all those relating to the burning of, of diesel. So uh, in large part, that would be um, probably in, in order of emission kind of scale would be uh, the mining fleets. So uh, Terry put up a, a, some photos of some of the large scale haul trucks that we use, keeping in mind that um, you know, the mining industry runs open pit and underground. And in fact, Oz Minerals is primarily an underground operator at the moment. So the, the trucks are not quite as large as the, as the big, um, the big haul packs that you see in the, in the open pits. Um, so mostly from, uh, diesel trucks and diesel loaders, uh, that carry the ore and the waste around from the mine, um, up to surface in our case. Um, so that would be probably priority number one. Priority number two would probably be around um, uh, the freight, the, 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 the transport of freight and also our product. Um, so this is an off-site emission effectively. So uh, you'll appreciate that we bring a lot of uh, consumables to site. Um, and so there's a lot of freight associated with that. Uh, and also, uh, our product has to be transported um, to, to market. So uh, also in the uh, slide that Terry put up, there's a, a, some photographs of um, the concentrate that we produce. Um, so Oz Minerals produces uh, sort of three or 400,000 tons a year of, of, of concentrate and that has to be transported to market. So there's, uh, there's scope uh, one emissions associated with the burning of the diesel to, to transport that. Um, somewhere you can look and we can actually provide this, um, a link to this is our sustainability report, which actually breaks down our emissions uh, into scope one, two and three um, across, uh, across our entire value chain. So we can provide a link to that as well. Um, yeah, I actually think we've got that in the, the challenge at the moment. So I think if, um, uh, if anyone's got any questions about that, that's, that should be at the very, very, um, very, very bottom. Um, and you can also see under the additional resources section, there's there's a bit of a table there that outlines that. But um, 
for anything there's anything else we can provide um in there obviously yeah we'll, we'll get that up on the forums and the the challenge page as well um uh, I'll just see if anyone else has any other questions before we before we uh, wrap up here. Um, just got a few few comments there. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Colin and 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 Gordon for the um, for the feedback there. That that's really great. Um, if we don't have any more, then I guess we can start wrapping up. Um, so obviously, as Brett mentioned, the challenge wraps up on the twenty eighth of May. Um, if you do need any support finalizing your submission, please uh, be sure to reach out. Um, we're here to support you in that. Um, uh, for the people who have submitted early feedback, we'll be getting that out to you over the next week or so. Um, so sit tight, that will be coming. Um, as, as a reminder as well, please make sure in your final submission that you are using that experiment proposal template as that's gonna allow us to kind of compare and contrast and, and better understand uh, what, what you're proposing there. Um, but with that said, um, as I mentioned earlier, if you, if you do have any other questions, anything like that, um, just pop them on the forum or Slack um, either about the actual challenge itself or, or getting your submission sorted. Um, the other thing as well is this, uh, this uh, session will be, has been recorded, so it'll be up online over the next sort of few days. Um, so for you to review, you kind of go back over. And again, if you've got any questions after doing that, pop them up. Um, other than that though, um, oh, Mark has a good question. Um, can we submit more than one experiment? Just before yeah, we go to that. Of course, absolutely. Yep. Cool, so um, yeah, if you do have more than one experiment, um, we're obviously really keen to hear about it, um, about all your different ideas. Um, the other thing as well that I think we've touched on before is that if you kind of, you have an idea, but it's not really at that experiment level yet, um, I think we touched on it in the language that just jump on jump on Slack, we can kind of talk about it there. Um, again, really, really keen to hear about any anything and everything you've um, kind of running through your head. Um, but with that, um, Brett, uh, Terry, thank you very much for, for jumping in and hosting this session and answering anyone's questions. Um, Brett, Terry, is there anything else you wanted to add before we, before we close out? Uh, thanks, Matt. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for, uh, for your interest in the challenge and for taking the time to come on and, and, uh, and listen to us. Um, hopefully you found it useful. Um, we're on a bit of a journey and uh, we're pleased to have you guys uh, along on the journey with us. Um, and thanks to Terry as well for, uh, for, for supporting with this and uh, to Matt and the Unearth team for, for all your support as well. It's much appreciated. Well, great. Thanks everybody. And don't be hesitant in putting forward your submissions. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, re really excited to see what everyone, everyone comes back with. Um, but with that, I think we'll wrap up there. Thank you everyone so much for coming today. Um, thank you all for bringing forth your questions. It's been a really insightful discussion. Um, and yeah, look, looking forward to seeing what comes through by uh, the 28th of May. Thanks, guys. Bye.